Now, I'm, I'm a futurist, among other things, and uh, uh, one of the things that we do is look for what's called weak signals of change. And a, a weak signal of change is uh, um, almost before, an, uh, well, before something gets to the popular press, certainly. Before anybody writes a story about it or makes a movie about it, um, indicators that a change is coming, either a social change or a technological change, um, and these things appear in the form of sometimes they're scientific papers, sometimes they're um, works of philosophy, um, sometimes they're uh, just items in the news, and, and we collect and collate these things. And so what I'm going to do today is just report on um, some weak signals of change that I think are starting to become strong signals of change, or will in the, uh, in the very near future. Uh, and they have to do with our relationship, well, the way we define ourselves as, as, as human beings and our relationship with the natural world. In other words, I'm increasing our scope to the cosmic level again. Um, and it may be inappropriate to do that um, uh, in the low blood sugar part of the day, but I'm going to give it, give it a shot. <laughs> um, and in a very serious sense, uh, how we think about each other is critical to whether we treat each other with respect or dignity or, or as objects to be manipulated and used. This is a very old idea in, in philosophy. Immanuel Kant put it this way. He said that human beings should be treated as ends rather than means. A very simple concept, but a, a very profound one, and it has a lot of ramifications. And the difference between treating somebody as an end and treating them as a means is the difference between building schools and playgrounds and building concentration camps. So it's an important distinction. Um, and we've become sort of natural at, uh, at making that distinction. And I've lost my pointer. Um, there's a pretty simple change that I'm observing um, in, in terms of weak signals right now. And it, it seems to be, or have to do with the traditional Western opposition between ideas of agency and nature. Um, this is, uh, I'm going to use the word agency in a different way than uh, um, uh, it was used yesterday. Sure. Yeah, the, the way that Jay used it. Um, I'm talking about agency in the sense of effectiveness in um, causing change, any kind of change. Uh, and in, in the Western tradition, we, we have sort of two ideas. The idea of passive nature, which just sort of lays there, waiting for a command, and agency. And agency takes a variety of different forms. Um, it uh, comes in different guises. I'll, I'll, I'll describe a couple of them in the, in the beginning, but, or, or, or in, a, in a minute. But um, just to sort of go to where we were before the current Western sort of divided view of the world that we have, uh, you could say that in the beginning, the thunder was the voice of a god. Fairies painted the colors on the flowers. Um, things moved and changed because something made them do so. Agency, in other words, was a part of everything that happened around us. We lived in a world that had two parts, the actors, or agents who did things, and the things that they did things to. It was a very straightforward and simple sort of division of the world. In, in one sense, you could say that nature was the stage on which the drama of agency is played out. Um, and you'll find this everywhere if you start to look for it. It lurks in all of our attitudes towards the world around us. Um, in the idea of God as a, a separate uh, absolute agent, uh, in spirits of nature, animism, ghosts, the effective soul, which is separable from the body and is the agent that drives the body. Scientific laws are uh, an instance of the, the concept of agency because scientific laws are perceived or conceived of as existing outside of the natural world and yet somehow reaching in to move it and force it, in a sense, to do what they want it to do. There's the psychological agent, the mind, the rational and sovereign uh, king of the, of the body. Um, and recently, uh, what I take to be the idea of 
godlike artificial intelligence or a mathematical calculating engines as rational agents that can affect change in our future world. Um, this idea appears in the technological singularity um, notion. So that's sort of where we are, uh, where we naturally and instinctively see agency everywhere. But there's a kind of Copernican revolution that seems to be going on, and that's what I want to talk about. The, there is, in fact, uh, or has already been several Copernican revolutions, um, each one involving a progressive elimination of agency from our picture of the world. Uh, Arguably, that is what the Copernican Revolution is. It's the removal of agency from our picture of the world. So think about it this way. Newtonian physics and Copernican astronomy present the idea of motion without a prime mover. Because previously, of course, God was the one who moved the planets in their orbits. Newton removed God from that picture, removed the agent. So we have motion without a mover. Natural selection, which was Darwin's idea, presents the idea of design without a designer. In other words, agency has been removed from the picture of um, how forms evolve and develop. Computers are thought without a thinker in our century. Um, it's a funny thing. Giving up each one of these ideas of agency has actually returned more to us than it's taken away. Physics and astronomy gave us mastery over the world, the ability to look back in time to the very beginning of the universe. Understanding biology has given us medicine and agricultural revolutions, um, make it possible for billions of us to share the planet. The information revolution um, is changing how we relate to each other, how we govern ourselves, basically lets us make use of all the other knowledge that we've accumulated. But now, it seems that there's another Copernican revolution happening, one we, most of us haven't really noticed yet. And this one's coming from cognitive science, neuroscience, and philosophy. Uh, the ones, philosophy being the one source of knowledge that pretty much all of us have given up on. Um, but it's about to come around and have a big influence again. What's happening, well, if, if Newtonian physics and Copernican astronomy showed us motion without a prime mo mover, and natural selection showed us design without a designer, and computers are thought without a thinker, then what recent works in cognitive science and neuroscience and philosophy of mind are showing us is agency without an agent, or to put it another way, spirit without a soul. And this is huge. In the traditional Western view of the world, um, we have what I call sock puppets. Um, the human body is the sock puppet of consciousness. So the human body is the vehicle, consciousness is the driver. It's a pretty straightforward Cartesian no uh, notion of a material body motivated by an immaterial soul. And a lot of people think they've emancipated themselves from this view, uh, while in fact they still hold it. So for instance, transhumanists like Ray Kurzweil, who believe we'll all eventually upload ourselves into machines, um, are perpetuating this idea in the idea that, that the brain is a computer, mind is software, um, that's still body and soul under different names. Um, but in the neuroscience picture that's evolving, um, consciousness is the sock puppet, but not of, uh, or sorry, consciousness itself is a sock puppet. <laughs> it's the sock puppet of unconscious processes. In cognitive embodiments, uh, different variants, consciousness is the, the puppet of the body itself, which gets you into this very circular sort of thing. The biggest proponent of this idea is the German philosopher uh, Thomas Metzinger, who's got a book called Being No One, and another one called uh, The Ego Tunnel, uh, and both explore this idea. Um, my friend Peter Watts wrote a, a novel, Blind Sight, which explores the depressing notion that uh, consciousness itself is a, an illusion. Um, Metzinger's, Metzinger's combed through decades of neuroscience and uh, cognitive science research to find out what all that science is actually telling us about how the human mind actually works. And what he found is that the phenomenal self, in other words, how we experience ourselves to ourselves, is not a thing, it's a process. What he calls a transparent self-model. Um, 
or as Gertrude Stein would put it, uh, as far as the self is concerned, there's no there there. Uh, the self, insofar as it exists, is not actually a thing. Um, well, and, and, and you can object, uh, well, the soul is immaterial, so how could we find it to begin with? But that's not what Metzinger really means. What all his research shows uh, in pretty startling clarity is that neuroscientists can watch the gears and cogs of the mind actually turn as we think, as we um, make decisions. Um, they can actually see what's moving the sock puppet to a degree, not fully yet. Um, and there's no hand in that sock puppet. Um, there's no there there. There's no person or, or driver in that vehicle. The feeling of conscious control is assigned to our decisions and actions, for instance, uh, in, at least in some cases, after our body has already started moving. Um, by the time you know that you've made a decision to pick up a glass of water, your hand is already reaching to pick it up. We can perform many actions without the need of conscious control at all, even things like driving a car. How many times have you driven to work uh, and then had no memory whatsoever of the drive? Um, anyone have that? Could put up your hands? Yeah, pretty much everybody, right? Yeah, well, you weren't actually conscious at, at that time, or at least you were not uh, on a moment-by-moment -moment basis retaining any of what was, was going on. And if you damage the, right, the correct spot of your brain, you can turn a Republican into, into a Democrat or a Democrat into a Republican. Um, so even things that we consider uh, fundamental to our, uh, our, our moral center can be changed by um, a stray bullet or... Um, a falling brick. We know a lot more than we used to about how the mind works, in other words, and we know a lot more than most people think we know at this point. We know how near-death experiences work. We can actually, we know what that bright light in the tunnel is. We can induce that in perfectly healthy people. Um, we know how the brain gives rise to our sense of being in, in the body, at least in strictly phenomenal, uh, phenomenological terms. We can induce religious experiences in people. None of these things in a completely reliable way. Uh, there seem to be some people that you cannot induce a religious experience in, which is interesting. Um, so what we have now is the concept of um, uh, one of the concepts in neuroscience and cognitive science uh, is embodiment. Um, uh, there's a philosopher and uh, cognitive scientist named Annie Clark who's got a great book called Being There, which uh, uh, explores these ideas. Um, ex explores ideas like partial programs. Um, a partial program is where you take certain steps of an algorithm and you replace them with a simple appeal to the outside world. So, for instance, in artificial intelligence work, they used to think, well, how do you catch a pop fly in baseball? How would a robot catch a, a pop fly? Uh, well, obviously it would do some really complicated internal modeling of the path of the ball and do uh, uh, you know, complicated math to figure out the arc of the ball and then position itself uh, where the ball is gonna land. But that in, turns out not to be the way we catch a pop fly in baseball. The way we do it is by running backwards while keeping a fixed angle between the horizon and the ball. Oh, and we put our hand up at that angle. That's it. In other words, we don't do that calculation at all. We offload it to the outside world. And what Andy Clark has found is that the human brain appears to take every opportunity it can to offload what it does to the physical world around it uh, because it's fundamentally lazy. Uh, why do an internal calculation and create an internal model of the world around you when you can simply appeal to something in the outside environment that will give you the information you want? Uh, there are some people who say that the human mind is partial programs all the way down. In fact, that even in, uh, with regard to the mind itself, there's no there there. What's going on is um, a constant reaching out into the environment and pulling pieces of it together um, to do what looks like internal representation and thinking and all the other things that we have traditionally thought we're doing. Um, that's pretty radical. And it's not necessarily true. 
But uh, it is indicative, again, of, as I say, one of the weak signals that I'm seeing, um, that people are talking in this way about um, how human beings operate. Um, uh, an another uh, thinker, Edwin Hutchins, uh, has what he calls the, the, the concept of distributed cognition, where a, a certain thinking act can't actually be performed by one human being alone. It has to be performed by a team. He gives the example of uh, ship navigation close to shore, which is done by um, somebody who's taking soundings, somebody who's writing them down, somebody who's um, you know, taking sightings, and so on and so forth. It's a, an act of cognition, but it's not an act of cognition that's taking place in the head of any one person. It's uh, distributed thought, in a sense. Uh, and that's another thread of this. What Metzger and Clark and Hutchins are implying is that we can start to recognize ourselves as not just physical objects in the world, but as embedded strongly in the world that we live in. To the extent that we couldn't think without this world. We wouldn't be without this world. Cognitive embodiment is the idea that you could not, even in principle, separate the mind from the body and the world that it operates in. Those three things are all needed for us to exist at all. Um, and this is a complete exorcism of the idea of the ghost and the machine. Um, there's no room in this view, for an external agent that reaches in to the human and moves it around like the driver moves the car. That's not what's going on. Um, this is happening in other areas, too. And I'm not going to sort of belabor all the different places. Uh, for instance, Brian Cantwell Smith, who's the Dean of Information Science at the University of Toronto, uh, has come to similar conclusions about computing itself. Um, he says that computers don't even, remote, even remotely work the way we think they do. Um, he spent 20 years looking for a theory of computing. Uh, and after all of that, he says at the end, we will never have a theory of computing, I claim, because there is nothing there to have a theory of. Computers aren't sufficiently separate, uh, separate or special. They involve an inter interplay between meaning and mechanism, period. That's all there is to say. Um, so the idea of computers as containing, again, some kind of agency, some kind of separate magical thing that reaches out to, or reaches in to the physical world and can move it around appears to be false as well. So the Co Copernican revolution is even reaching mathematics and computing. Uh, the book uh, Where Mathematics Comes From by uh, Lakoff and Nunez talks about uh, um, mathematics as an entirely human construct. Uh, they say, after a couple of decades of research in uh, how people actually think when they do mathematics, that not only does the way that we think when we do mathematics not imply a separate realm of mathematical reality, it precludes it. They say that what they have found is that there is no sort of uh, platonic realm of mathematical truth. Uh, mathematics is what we do. It's a human activity. It's fully embodied. It's part of the world as we're part of the world. So the Copernican revolutions resonate and, and ring and ring and ring continuously through more and more parts of our lives. Um, So here in the early 21st century, we find ourselves with nothing left of the idea of agency that we used to have. There's only a vast sort of impersonal nature, completely devoid of it. Um, cognitive science and computing show us as we apparently really are, as mechanisms devoid of agency, holding up a sock puppet, the conscious self, that merely imitates agency. That there's nothing within ourselves any more than there is in the rest of the natural world. And this is where some people start to panic. This is the exact conclusion that they've always feared we would reach about ourselves. Because they think that if we don't uphold the distinction between people who have agency and things which do not, that people will end up being treated as things. 
And this is the fear that's expressed in science fiction stories where the machines take over, or repressive governments that treat human beings like cogs in a machine. It's the fear that underlies movies like The Matrix. It's the fear that underlies Metropolis or 1984 or Terry Gilliam's black comedy Brazil. It's the fear also that lies behind uh, much of our anxiety about the technological singularity. But remember that we gained more than we lost with each of the previous Copernican revolutions. Um, the same might happen in this case if we give up the notion of the psychological agent, provided, in other words, that we take one last step, a step where we recognize that we are physical things like any other things, and yet we still deserve somehow to be treated as ends rather than means. It's precisely this final step that some philosophers, artists, and thinkers are starting to take. This is the weak, the weak signal of change that I'm seeing right now, and it's a very, very important one. I don't know if you noticed the little logical maneuver that I, I, I pulled just now. Remember I said if we don't uphold the distinction between people who have agency and things which do not, people will end up being treated as things. But this isn't completely true. That's one way you could look at it. But there is another way. If we remove the distinction between agency and non-thinking matter, between us and the rocks and the trees, then you could either conclude that agency doesn't exist and everything is just means, or you could conclude that everything has agency, that everything is, at least potentially, an end in itself, that everything has equal dignity. Um, and I've, I've decided to label this idea the, the, the dignity of the real. Um, because remember, how we think about each other is critical to how we treat each other with respect and dignity, or whether we treat ourselves with uh, respect and dignity, or as things to be manipulated and used. But if this is true for our relationships with one another, it's equally true for our relationships with the physical world. And uh, previously, well, for about a century now, we've treated the, the, the physical world with contempt. Um, as what uh, Heidegger calls standing reserve, material to be used. Because only we have agency, only we exist. The world itself does not. But if all of these changes that I'm talking about happen, all of a sudden there's this space opened up where the world itself um, has the possibility of being an agent like us uh, uh, again. And some philosophers are talking about this. For instance, Jane uh, Bennett. She has a book called Vibrant Matter. She asked the question, what would happen to our thinking about politics if we took more seriously the idea that technological and natural materialities were themselves actors alongside and within us, were vitalities, trajectories, and powers irreducible to the meanings, intentions, or symbolic values that human beings invest in them? In other words, what if we're not alone in this world but if we live side by side with other powers, which take the form of glaciers and planets and um, uh, the sun as it rises in the morning. Um, and this might seem a little abstract, but do you remember the, the eagles of Hornby Island? This was a, a webcam that some uh, people set up on an island in BC that uh, um, watched some eagles in their nest. And uh, it, uh, the webcam got a lot of fans. Hundreds of thousands of people watched these, these eagles. And they became quite committed to the, uh, the lives of the eagles. Um, somehow, by putting a webcam on this tree, the eagles had been brought into human society. And it's one of the, the, the possibilities that I'm exploring in my work right now, that um, natural systems can be, become um, actors in human society by giving them sort of uh, their own sock puppets, let, let, let's say, their own uh, means of participation. I'm about to run out of time, uh, about halfway through uh, some of the ideas that I wanted to, uh, to, to, to talk about. But the key point is that um, uh, these changes are, 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 are happening and people are starting to talk about them. And there's a coherent narrative that's, that's beginning to uh, emerge. Um, it appears in things like the Ecuadorian Constitution, which has now enshrined rights of nature. The Bolivian constitution has done the same thing. 
So we're going from treating only human beings as ends to beginning to treat um, natural systems as ends as well. And that may be what we need to do in order to survive this century, granted the depredations that we've been wreaking on the natural systems that we actually depend on. Um, it, it's not so much a matter of us extending a largesse to the, the physical world and saying, okay, I'll preserve the rainforest because it's good for me. It's coming to the realization that the rainforest is an end in itself um, and is a thing in itself and a political actor in a sense in, in and of itself. And, and so are all the other systems that surround us. I don't know where this is all going to go, but um, you know, I think it's a pretty exciting set of new developments because it gives us a way out of the dichotomous thinking that we've been stuck in for a very long time. Um, and it potentially gives us a way out of the wars between, say, industry and environmentalism, which are becoming so entrenched in their positions and so separate in their ideologies. Um, and uh, that's all I have to say.